Every rocket launched into space has a mission. The most important of all is to bring back vital information recorded by instruments in the nose cone. As most of these rockets plummet into the sea, I was called in to assist an advanced experimental unit. My assignment was to recover the nose cones underwater as quickly as possible. After a long search, I was getting an indication on a special type detector designed to respond to directional signals from the nose cone. They became stronger and guided me in. I prepared to send up a marker buoy, I knew for sure the recoveries were taking too long. I didn't know how dangerous they could be. later, I hobbled into the office of Dr. Bartok, the scientist who directed the XM rocket series of experiments. Pretty rough getting around. A little. Yeah, that was a mighty close call, Mike. I can't hold you to this contract. Oh, close call is a part of my business. What bothers me is the time it takes to locate the nose cones. Yeah, that's right. Well, here's the record. Average time and 12 recoveries, 14 hours. Six nose cones not recovered at all. Yeah, that's the trouble. If we don't find them fast, we don't find them at all. What I need is a new operating procedure. What else is there to do but to swim down and search for them? No, my detector isn't doing the job. Let's see, now, when's our next flight? The 25th? The 25th, yeah. Well, by then, my leg ought to be OK. And by that time, I ought to have something new to show you. On the 25th, we were alerted for the flight and re-entry of the XM-17 rocket. We had received initial vectors to guide us from a rocket tracking ship. Our own scanning devices homed us to the impact area. To recover the nose cone of the XM-17, I was going to rely on speed. The boat would get us to the approximate area rapidly. A power unit would give me speed for the underwater search. While I went astern to ready for my jump off, Dr. Bartok kept watching to sight the splash point. When we reached the impact zone, my underwater scooter gave me good speed. It also enabled me to maneuver freely. Neither speed nor freedom of movement was enough. We struck out on the XM-17. I decided to use a midget submarine as an underwater missile chaser. I gained one big advantage. I could carry additional air tanks in the sub. This permitted me to search underwater for a long period without surfacing. But the sub was slow. I couldn't maneuver as well as I could with a scooter and my visibility was limited. Despite hours of searching, I didn't find the XM-20 at all. The midget sub wasn't the answer. To achieve the speed and visibility that I wanted, I rigged an underwater sled. I was able to control my depth in the water, but it was too difficult to direct the course of the boat that towed me. I soon realized that a sea sled wasn't the answer either. When the X-24 was launched, 
I was determined not to fail. I knew that I had to combine speed, maneuverability, and good detection equipment. To attain speed, I went back to boats. We were using a large one, guided visually and by radar, to reach the impact area. Then I boarded a secondary search boat for the final phase. It was a fast outboard with a sensitive metal detector fixed to its hull. The pickup of the device extended into the water on a boom. Watching the instruments for indications as we executed a wide search pattern. Twenty seconds after reaching the area, the boom began to pick up weak signals. As we zeroed in close to our target, my assistant and I headed for the bottom. Are you certain that you can always duplicate the speed of that last recovery? Well, it's all simple equipment. A boat, a detector, and me. Nothing much to go wrong. All right. In that case, the XM series will be changed to PXM. P for passenger. Mm. Well, if it's all right with them, it's all right with me. They have to be recovered within one hour of impact. Oh, don't you worry, boy. I'll get you up in time. After a flight through space, Dr. Bartok's mice and the vital information they could reveal were sealed in a capsule inside a nose cone somewhere on the ocean bottom. My job was to reach them before their limited air supply was exhausted. Dr. Bartok had given me a diagram to enable me to remove the airtight plate quickly and recover the capsule.
They did it. They had no choice. That's so much for PXM-1. Next, the white rat. Then guinea pig, rabbit, monkey. I scheduled 32 flights. Well, let's hope that we'll have 32 recoveries, huh? In the course of the next three months, I accomplished the recoveries as scheduled. My operating procedure was working well. This recovery would be the last of the PXM series. I was looking for a space passenger named Angel Face. We called our passenger Angel Face not because of her looks, but because her flight took her closer to the angels than any animal had been before. Unfortunately, she couldn't tell us about her trip, but through his stethoscope, Dr. Bartok got the story that he was looking for. Beautifully. Well, that's the end of the PXM series. 100% success. Calling my next series the HXM series. The next series? I thought this was the end of it. HXM, what's the H for? H for human. Human? We've been working on it for months in the laboratory, under simulated conditions. Yeah, no. Doing it for real. Who's it gonna be, the first human? Me. Using animals for experiments in space was one thing. But now Dr. Bartok, the director of the rocket series, was determined to be shot into space himself, inside a nose cone. In addition to an air supply for the capsule, he would carry an underwater breathing apparatus of special design for the ascent from the nose cone. I checked him out on it. A new miniature tape recorder combined with a throat microphone would go out into space with him. With this unit, he would continuously record his sensations, his reactions, and all the physiological data which a scientist could discern. This would provide a valuable record for future analysis. His flight was programmed to ascend 400 miles above the Earth and to return to a predetermined sector of ocean. But at this point, I was more concerned about Dr. Bartok than about any data that he might gather. The target area is this one square mile in the ocean right there. What are you worried about? Well, I know it all proves out, but... Mike, the underwater ejection is completely automatic. In one minute, or at a depth of 40 feet, whichever is sooner, the capsule is ejected from the nose cone by compressed air. If it works, or what if it doesn't, and you don't come up to the surface? I will. And you're going to be standing by to pick me up. What could be simpler? Well, I can think of a lot of things. One week from today, Monday, 6 a.m. It was Monday, August 3rd, the most important day in the logbook of the rocket experiments. Dr. Bartok was inside a capsule within the nose cone of that missile. Incredible and frightening, yet it was happening. And it was my responsibility to recover him, alive. We were using the system that had worked well before, but this time we counted on an additional safety factor that Dr. Bartok's capsule would be automatically ejected and rise to the surface. Capsule should have enough 
four minutes ago. Maybe something did go wrong. We can't wait any longer. I realized immediately that the ejector mechanism must have failed for some reason. That meant Bartok's life would depend on his limited air supply. I kept scanning the surface while Noam was watching the dials of the detector. Fifty minutes. The sensitive metal detector had done its job, but it had led us to an old wreck. We had lost crucial minutes reaching it. I headed back toward the boat. Only a few hundred yards away, Dr. Bartok's nose cone was wedged into a rocky bottom, but I didn't know it. All I knew was that if he was still alive, he was desperately waiting for us to find him. Sensation during acceleration. G-forces are within human physical tolerance. Johnville experiments confirm. Psychological hazard much greater. My sensation. Like I was at the bottom of a deep well. With a mile high pile driver resting on me. Pressing me. Smothering me. Thirty minutes. Physiological effects. Stomach sensation. In weightless condition, danger point, tendency to throw up. Wearing of oxygen mask presents danger of strangulation. More research needed. Mike, another indication. Yeah, well, there's only 20 minutes left. You better not be wrong this time. Double back, half speed. On physical and mental sensations, I have nothing further to report. Failure of underwater ejection due to chance. Judging by the angle at which I'm lying, rear closure plate is blocked by ocean bottom. One thing more. Martha, dear, please don't grieve for me. The moon and the stars can be had. If only you're willing to pay the price. I gladly pay my share. Only 10 minutes left. We had to be near the nose cone. We had to be. That's it. Hey, hold it in. I'll stop. found it this time, 
But how are we going to get Dr. Bartok out? The cone was wedged tightly on its base. I could see that we wouldn't be able to move the nose cone ourselves. the hook, hoping the boat would be able to dislodge the nose cone, and in time. told me Dr. Bartok was alive, but I still had to remove the plate of the jammed automatic ejector. Back next week at the same time with another sea hunt story. Plan to be with us again, huh?